please help me welcome the CEO of Nidhi IO, Mr. Amitabh Kant. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we've had uh, three days of uh, very uh, great energy, vibrancy, and dynamism here. I mean, really terrific energy here. And uh, we have a power packed panel uh, on this very unique subject today. And let me just introduce uh, the panel, very distinguished panel. Let me welcome them. Uh, first and foremost, let me get on stage Dipali Goenka. She's the CEO and man Joint Managing Director of Wellspun India Limited. Uh, Dipali is a very accomplished business leader known for her dynamism, entrepreneurial spirit and passion for people who, who's driving the growth of Wellspun textile business to one billion US uh, dollars globally. Uh, any one of you who goes and witnesses Wimbledon, uh, all the towels used there are all well-spun towels. Uh, <clears throat> let me next welcome Christina Davison. Christina is the co-founder and managing partner at iEurope Capital. <clears throat> Christina Perkin Davison uh, is the co-founding partner. She's a private equity, this is a private equity fund that invests in technology. Uh, it invests in companies in the emerging economies of Central Eastern Europe. She advises entrepreneurs on ways to grow their businesses by taking advantage of social networks to expand their markets, engage in collaborative partnerships, and follow disciplined cash flow management techniques. Wonderful to have you with us, Christina. Let me uh, next welcome Leroto Selena Motsamai, who's the founder and CEO of Google Leroto. Welcome, Leroto. Lovely to have you with us. Uh, Leroto Motsamai is the founder and CEO of Petrolink, a South African based manufacturer of high grade industrial and automotive lubricants, oils, and greases that she founded in 2012. That's an amazing area to work in, Lerato. Uh, very, very unusual, but amazing. Following, she's had a remarkable, a very re rewarding 15-year career in the petrochemical sector. Uh, she's been named by uh, several business reports as one of the four women influencing the energy sector in South Africa. And she plays a very active role in various industry bodies in South Africa. Lovely to have you with us. Uh, next, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Manish Sabarwal, who's the chairman uh, and co-founder of Team Lease Services. This is India's largest staffing and human capital firm. Team Lease has over 130,000 employees in 5,000 cities and is implementing India's first vocational university in Gujarat and first national private-public partnership apprenticeship program. Wonderful to have you with us, Manish. <laughs> Last but not the least, let me welcome Mark Green. Uh, he's a very distinguished member of this U.S. delegation here. Uh, he's the U.S. aid administrator. Welcome, Mark. Lovely to have you with us. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, this is a power-packed panel full of very, very distinguished people here. Let me uh, let me start off uh, with let me start off with Mark. Uh, Mark, I've been here for three days. I've interacted with a lot of men and a lot of women entrepreneurs. Why is it, uh, you know, the women entrepreneurs in this conference are just getting smarter and smarter and smarter, and the men entrepreneurs are getting dumber and dumber and dumber. Why is that happening? <laughs> I mean, the women entrepreneurs here, they just outsmart so, the men. So is there a reason that you asked me? <laughs> <laughs> So 
So I must that, 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 getting dumber and dumber and dumber as we go. That, that question was specifically focused on you. The USA. So, so what, I, what I will say <laughs> is I think we see in this summit uh, the vibrancy of women entrepreneurs. And I think there is a sense that this is the time for women entrepreneurs, uh, that uh, they are rising, and as they rise, we all rise. So uh, I think what you're seeing is a natural optimism that comes as women uh, rise further and further and take their rightful role at the table. So I, I wouldn't put it as dumber and smarter. Others may do that. Instead, I would say that we are feeling the energy, optimism, and hopefulness that comes with women entrepreneurs having their moment. Lovely, lovely, wonderful. Uh, uh, Dipali, I mean, you've had a great track record of uh, working in partnership uh, with a vast range of women groups. Uh, you know, I mean, given the fact that uh, India has seen a lot of self-help groups in rural areas, I mean, we have about close to 2.2 million self-help groups, amazing work being done by seven, several self-help group women. Uh, you know, I mean, our track record shows that uh, women self-help groups, they return their money back to financial institutions much quicker, much faster. They're better in repaying money back. Their track record is incredibly high compared to large businesses. I just wanted to ask you that uh, given that 70% of India's population lives in villages, how do we empower and encourage entrepreneurship amongst rural women? How do we drive this agenda forward? First of all, this question is very close to uh, our heart at Wells Fund because we employ around 20,000 people at textiles and our vow to take on 20% women at Wellspun is like paying its uh, dividends. I just want to quote that, you know, when you talk about uh, the rural India and uh, I want to just have an example here. There's a girl called Agni Bhadra. She basically um, was at Wellspun. She was chosen by Walmart in a program of multi-skilling and multitasking by an NGO called Swasti to go to Arkansas to present what she learned. Imagine the kind of aspiration that she created for the young girls in the rural part of our country. And when you, when you say that, I think it created several, several Agni Bhadras in Gujarat and at Wells Fund. And I think that, was, that motivated a lot of girls to take that forward. So when you talked about mentorship, I think that's where the mentorship begins. Thank you. Loretto, you're such a unique role model. I mean, to be such a dynamic entrepreneur in the world of petroleum and petrochemicals, rarely seen in Africa, rarely seen in Africa. I mean, such a unique role model. I mean, how do we create more women role models like you who embody the principles of uh, empowerment? Thank you, Mr. Kant. Firstly, I'd like to thank the city of Hyderabad and the government of India for the invitation, as well as the U.S. government. I believe that as I sit here in a very esteemed panel and very privileged is I do not only represent my country, South Africa, but I represent the women of Africa because we, our issues are very much the same. And earlier on, I was just saying to my colleague here that the issues of the women in India are very much the same. So we're all fighting the same struggle, the same causes. Um, having said that, I am a firm believer that women don't just build businesses, they build nations. So at the end of the day, that wherever you've been placed in a privileged position of being able to make a difference, doesn't matter how small, doesn't matter how big, it really is your responsibility and your purpose to be able to make that difference. Now, those women who are role models, like myself, are they? They do exist. But many of them are not 
seen as role models because of the environments that they are serving in. A typical example would be my late mother, who for me represented a faceless, a nameless individual, but was a strength to the community in which she came from. She was a nursing sister with six children, but in between that, she supplemented that salary with being the first taxi driver in my city, Port Elizabeth. With the car maintenances running high, she moved on to becoming a distributor of M-Way products, moving on to becoming a distributor of, Hoover, of, of Kirby Hoovers and every other American products that came into the African continent, she was always one of the first people to grab that opportunity. Why she went that way was because she was not only meeting the needs of my family, but also the needs of her extended family and that of her community. And I believe that women like my mother are existing, but they are not given the opportunities, they are not given the tools to be able to make the kind of impact that we see from other women like myself because of social media, because of access to knowledge and information. So, Mr. Kant, I think that as a woman and as a leader, there are many of us who are out there, they may not look like me, but they certainly are there. We need to actually find them and give them the platforms that they really are already serving on. Uh, Leroto, what has been your experience here at GS 2017? Have you met a lot of good young entrepreneurs? It's just been absolutely phenomenal. I mean, we hear countries on the map and we hear them on television. Um, but to actually meet the individuals coming from those various countries was just for me really a, a, a huge privilege. Um, I always call myself a global citizen and indeed coming to Hyderabad, it certainly emphasized and, and put that stamp or seal of being a global citizen. And I think all the people that are here in this room represent that kind of individual one who is looking at solving the global goals, the, the, the sustainable development goals in their own way, in their own capacity. And truly, it has been one remarkable experience that I'm very grateful for. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Christina, you played such a critical role in supporting, promoting, financing women entrepreneurs across Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, tell me what sort of policies can companies, uh, you know, policies companies can ha have to encourage more women to participate and speak up, you know, can we have greater gender parity in companies, a conscious gender parity in companies, particularly in emerging markets? Well, first I'd like to thank everyone uh, for being here. I've met the most amazing group of entrepreneurs from around the world here. And especially, I'd like to thank the Indian government and the U.S. government for collaborating on this amazing conference. Thank you. And wasn't Ivanka fantastic? Yes. Yeah. Oh, she was terrific. Um, Central Europe, it's an emerging market that is a very special place, not unlike other emerging markets. I like to call them converging markets. Um, in those markets, there are very many women who have set up networks across the region who are, we are trying to fund, uh, trying to support. And in that effort, we hope that they will also reach out to other women in other emerging markets to create an even larger network. There, it's very important that women support each other. That's very critical. Um, Madeleine Albright used to say, there's a little place in hell for women who don't help other women. And I think that's very important. Yeah. In terms of our efforts, I think it's very important for a venture capitalist like me to make sure that we listen to entrepreneurs who have a great idea who are women, not just because they're women, but because they've got a great idea and they have a great business. And we try to seek those women out. Uh, we try to support them with our amazing network and our amazing experience that we have uh, cultivated over the years. 
We have a lot of Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley families who are invested in our fund, and we try to put them together to elevate them, to elevate these entrepreneurs to an even higher level. So that's how we collaborate with them. Lovely, lovely. Uh, Manish, uh, you know, one of, one of the worrying factors about India is that the level of women participation in terms of jobs is, and their contribution to India's GDP still remains at low level. I mean, one of the big challenges which we, we're trying to push through self-help groups, through schemes like Beti Bachao, Beti Padao, Ujwala, many other schemes, is to push the level to ensure that we're able to push their participation in education held to much higher levels. I mean, what do we do as a country? What do we do to ensure greater participation at all levels of businesses? I mean, how do we, how do we enhance their contribution to India's GDP uh, in the next decade to much higher levels? What are the four or five critical issues we must take head on? Yeah, so I think there are two interrelated questions. The first is one of the most enduring mysteries is why has women's labor force participation in India fallen from 31% to 18% in the last 25 years when reforms have opened up when, and stuff. And the second question which everybody will have a different answer to is does India have a jobs problem or do we have a wages problem? And I'd like to submit those two questions are closely related. India doesn't have a jobs problem. Everybody who wants a job has a job. They just don't have the wages. They just don't have the wages they want. I think that's important um, because 50% of India is self-employed. That's not self-employment. That's self-exploitation. Um, most of the people who are self-employed. So I think that we have to be stop. Our, we have to. Be Can careful. you all hear Manish at the back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you be a little louder? Yeah. So it. This, this notion of self-employment as a solution to India's sort of jobs problem is, is fraught with challenges sometimes, I would submit. Um, you know, not everybody can be an entrepreneur. Not all entrepreneurship is viable. So obviously we need to create as many entrepreneurial opportunities as we can. So the question is, is the role of government setting specific areas on fire or is it creating the conditions for spontaneous combustion, right? I mean, everybody has their favorite industry. She'll probably say textile, somebody else will say leather, somebody else will say light industrial. But we have a very bad track record at predicting where jobs will be in the future. So I think the current track which India has taken is actually probably good for all excluded people in the labor force. You know, from where I sit, you know, I've hired somebody every five minutes for the last five years, but we've only hired 5% of the kids who came to us for a job. There is not that much difference between a ministry for Dalit employment or a ministry for Jat employment or Gujar employment and a ministry for women's employment. And let me explain why I say that. That it's what we need in India is formalization, urbanization, industrialization, and human capital. We have to fix our schools, colleges, and skill system. We, have, we only have 52 cities with more than a million people. We have 600,000 villages. 200,000 of those villages have less than 200 people. We need to urbanize because higher productivity, higher wages, women employment. But the most important thing we need to do is formalize our labor force. Women's labor force participation, one of the most credible explanations I've heard is that women were fine with working on farms, but they're not fine in working in informal wage employment because of various other reasons. So if you formalize wage employment, women's la labor force participation will rise. We've seen the youth you sort of in labor force participation show up when you educate women. So I think that the four things that India could do is formalize, urbanize, industrialize, and human capital. Thanks. You know, I'd, I'd like this to be more of an interactive session, so I'm gonna open it up to a floor a little while later. But Dinesh, uh, can you organize a couple of mics so that the audience can grill this panel as well? Just a couple of mics, if we can get. Uh, so, uh, Mark, let me move on to you. And, sure. And uh, you're such a critical player in the U.S. administration. I mean, you're the you're the administrator of USAID, which is which is such a major organization. I wanted to ask you, what can men do? I mean, when women win, we all win. But what can men consciously do to help equalize and improve the participation of women, uh, particularly uh, in emerging markets? Well, I think there are a number of things. I think first and foremost, we have to recognize the particular barriers that women face. Uh, barriers of access to credit 
is one of the critical barriers. Uh, in too many parts of the world, in rural areas, there's a digital divide. Uh, women in, uh, simply don't have enough access to uh, IT, to the Internet. And, and we know these days, if you're not online, if you don't have access to the Internet, you're really shut off, not just from opportunities, but from information. And so I think we have to take those issues on. And I think we have to recognize that oftentimes some of the health challenges that affect men and women affect women disproportionately. So, for example, here in India, uh, where tuberculosis is such a staggering challenge, we have to recognize that women who have TB often face a particular stigma that locks them out of society, locks them out of uh, economic opportunity, even locks them out of the marketplace. So I think what men have to do and what uh, agencies like USAID have to do, identify the specific barriers that women face and apply tools to help them take those on. We know that women entrepreneurs have great ideas, great vibrancy, that, that they're looking for their seat at the table. We have to identify those barriers that stop them from taking that seat. No, I think it's such an important point you've made, and um, TB is totally curable, actually. Uh, it, it, totally it's curable. curable. And, uh, totally unnecessary. Yeah, absolutely unnecessarily. Uh, so, Dipali, I mean, what has been your experience? I mean, you, you work with a number of uh, uh, women groups. You work with a number of women enterprises. What has been the backward linkage of Wellspun to women enterprises at the backward? And uh, how have uh, you facilitated the rise of women enterprises? Uh, at Wellspun, we believe that when we, uh, when we talk about business, we become the agents of change. Mm -hmm. And the biggest struggle that we have seen in our environment and our communities is that women getting that opportunity to work. And hence, uh, when we moved to Anjar, uh, Ranafka, which is, I think, if you guys don't know where Anjar is, it is in, it's the part of Ranaf Kutch where uh, it was devastated it, uh, by an earthquake in 2002-2003 and everything was brought down to rubble. Now, if you see that part of the country, it has the highest GDP. operate their bank accounts. As they operated their bank account, they learned how to even, you know, do cut and sew. The children could go to school. And you had an empowered woman who would influence her girl to go to school. If she couldn't go to school, there were smart schools and smart education brought by Wellspun to her, to her uh, you know, doorsteps. So, you know, I think the whole thing, uh, uh, Mr. Kant, is about integrating the whole communities. So we work with the communities. We have these girls who work at Wellspun, where we have the girl hostels, where the girls come in from Jharkhand, which are the remote part of the countries. We make them, we, we give them an opportunity to graduate. So they have an aspiration to grow in their lives. Because by the end of it, it's not just being in, in a kind of a blue collared operator. It's going to be about how you grow in your lives and see that kind of a life cycle. So it's about the communities where women have, where they get literate enough, the children go to school, they learn how to do their craft, and um, if you've, uh, there's a close, pro there's the closest project to our heart is um, sanitary napkins. Maximum deaths in our country happen because uh, women are not adequately um, uh, having enough um, supply of, uh, you know, um, to support them. So we actually are working with self-help groups to make sanitary napkins so that, you know, uh, you know they, in fact, they contribute to make, making those sanitary napkins. And it also contributes to creating those communities where women are confident enough to step, step out of their households. Because in India, people don't step out of their households if, they, if they're going through their, uh, you know, uh, men menstruation. So those are these things, I think. So it's about having an empowered, um, empowered society and communities. Um, imagine 2.9 trillion dollars could be contributed 
to our country if you could bridge the gap between women and the men, the, the complete diversity. And by 2025, Mr. Khan, this is for you, if 68 million women can go to work, I think India would be a very different country. So I think when you, so when you talk about India and you talk about women and when you talk about Wellspun, I think there'll be several corporates like us who will be working in the communities, who will be empowering women and looking at the issues which are very, very important to India. Uh, a letter to, let me ask you, you know, I mean, Mark talked about the digital divide. But more than that, to me, the divide is in the world of nutrition, education, health. These are big challenges for India. I mean, how, do you, how are you confronting these challenges in Africa? Okay, so I think that I'll personalize the answer to that, Mr. Kant, is that um, heading a, a, a company that is seen to be headed by a woman in an industry that is male-dominated, um, it comes with the responsibility of being able to to, to pull other women in, in, in also pull them up as well as girls. So as a company, we have decided that our focus area will be in social impact in education. So in 2014, Petrolink started a, a girls academy called Girl Ignite Africa Academy. And the focus of that was truly to take girls from the age of 10 years old up until 19 years old. And these are girls who are coming from underprivileged communities where they are under-resourced. Even the schools that they attend, they do not have the same quality education, the same kind of exposure that a girl who comes from a privileged community does have. And what we do with them is that we meet on a weekly basis at a farm whereby it's very close to the communities that which they come from. And we focus on four areas. The first area is entrepreneurship, whereby the girls are given and taught about the SDGs. And they understand each and every one of those SDGs actually speaks to the communities that they come from. So why do we do that is that they actually begin to be the solution change makers for the communities that they come from instead of us being the ones who are constantly always bringing in the solution. So you want them to be the ones who actually embrace whatever it is that you want to implement in the community. We focus on that and what they do is to actually start off looking at the SDG that they've been given. They come up with a problem that they've identified in the community. So it could be clean, clean water and sanitation. It could be renewable energy, you know, quality education, gender issues, women and girls, etc. And once they, do, they, 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 they unpack the actual SDG and then they then come up with the solution. And you'd be amazed at the solutions that these girls come up with. We're talking about digital divide, and we're talking about girls who are coming from underprivileged environments, but because they've been given an opportunity to be able to come up with ideas and solutions, these girls come up with application, ideas for applications, ideas that truly could be groundbreaking, <coughs> given the resources to be able to implement them. We then also focus, so the entrepreneurship is really a social enterprising um, a, a module. We then look at leadership and we develop the girls from a spiritual perspective. We start off from there because many of them have gone through so much. So you may want to drill them and put all sorts of things on them, but until you have dealt with the soul of that girl, it will be very impossible for you to get into you know, their, their full potential. And then um, we look at, uh, a, we do math labs with them because each one of them, whether they're doing it on a higher grade or a lower grade, they have to have mathematics. So we employ tutors who come in, master's graduates from local universities in Johannesburg, who come and spend time tutoring these girls and really setting a foundation for them so that they understand that a 21st century education will require some form of mathematics, whether it's in finances, whether it's in IT, but maths will play a core part of it. Thanks. And lastly, we do wellness with them where the girls take care of their bodies. So I'm a cyclist and it was just a natural thing to engage the girls in cycling. Some uh, sports that they not ne necessarily are exposed to, but the, in, 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 in essence what we're looking at is a holistic program for the community whereby the girls are being raised to become leaders 
who will be servant leaders in the communities that they, they come from, as well as wherever they may find themselves. So that is how we are actually bridging that gap in terms of involving them from a very young age so that they understand that this is also their responsibility more than the governments or their parents or anybody else. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. A great example of community participation, actually. So I'm going to open it up to the floor. We have just a few moments. Please sit down. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, no parallel presentations. Shoot your questions. First choice to the lady here. Just get up and shoot. Very, very little time. And just no, no long winding questions. Shoot your questions straight away. Yep. Yell, yell. You got, you got a great voice. Just shout. Yeah, just, just shout. What's your question? No. Anybody with a question? Any lady with a question? Uh, I, I have a yeah, question, please, sir. Please shoot your question. Okay. I would like the esteemed panel to respond on how can we bridge that gap. There are very, percentage-wise, very few women CEOs in, in, around the world in every country, including India. So, yeah, so uh, Christina, I don't take that. Christina and then Thank Mark. You. Thank you very much. Well, it's true. And actually, there have been um, legislation in France, as you know, that legislated that companies that are publicly traded have to have a minimum of 40% uh, women as board members. Uh, interestingly, in the US right now, it's about 20%. Um, and there's a lot of effort that's being done right now to try to get that higher, obviously. Um, because it takes the uh, direction um, from the top of the board to tell management that this is a priority. Because if it's not a priority and it's not incented properly at the mid-level, then the flow of girls coming up the pipeline won't happen because people won't be paying attention to it because the men don't think it's a problem. And if they don't think it's a problem and they're not properly incented to do that, they, it won't happen. So it has to come from the top, and that's changing. Thanks. Mark, you want to add on to that? Uh, sure. Well, specifically, I think education. I think we have to do a better job of providing access to education for girls and women all around the world. Uh, secondly, I think we simply have to have as a declaratory statement, it is not possible in this rapidly changing complicated, complex world for us to meet the challenges that are there unless we're listening to all of our voices, every part of the community. Mm -hmm. And that must be a, a mission statement at every company, every organization, Wonderful. every level of government. Great. So I think that's what we must begin with. If we do that, everything is possible. That's a great one, Mark. Uh, so, I have, I have a question. So will, you, will you please sit down? We, this is about women first. Lady there. <laughs> My name is Chaudhary. In the very small company that I, in the very small company that we run, I have found that women have far higher productivity, better attitude, and longevity. My question to you is, on the success of Make in India, Incredible India, can you find a marketing campaign that lets companies know that, and then give them an incentive to employ a greater number of women? Because the statistic around going from 30% to 18% was shocking. Second question: Is there a way to incentivize? equal wage because even when we look at semi-skilled jobs and we work with contract manufacturers and large number of people employed women are paid 20 percent less so if the man is paid 250 rupees a day the woman will be paid 200 rupees for the same job okay and that's so manish question. will you respond to the second part of the question <coughs> i'll take on the first part the first part the second question is it's illegal <laughs> 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 Okay, so, you know, I'm, my belief is that, uh, you know, we need to focus 
My belief is that we need to really focus in a very big way on seven states of India, 201 districts of India, focus very, very strongly it's on education, on health, on nutrition. That is what is going to make a difference. It's not about a branding campaign. It's about providing education and health and ensuring and ensuring better livelihood for women. Yes, madam, what about you? I was going to say I agree with what you said. So my question to you is, in addition to that, when you're dealing with rural communities, yeah. right, yeah. where they have not, especially with young ladies, they have not seen women in the workforce, yeah. um, before something can be probable, I mean, uh, possible, it's got, I mean, before something can be probable, it's got to be possible. So how do you overcome those uh, social stigmas and, and social issues surrounding women going into work? Uh, so, Dipali, will you respond to this? You know, we, we, when we talk about social stigmas, it's all about how you can create those mentors within the communities. When you work in the uh, communities, creating examples in those communities is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And hence, I think that's where, uh, you know, is the role of uh, the corporates to get together to work with them. And that's what actually we are doing, actually. Can I? We are training them, we are multi-skilling them. And I'll give you an example. Not only we are not multi, uh, multi uh, teaching them how to multitask at home because they wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning. They, they handle the work, the household chores, then they come to work. Husband doesn't even lift up a spoon to do anything. But now we are training how, the men how they can share the responsibilities as well. So I think these are small steps forward, but actually they make a whole lot of difference. Yeah. Amitabh, can I? Well, uh, she's, uh, you know, Dipali, Dipali is, uh, you know, the Amitabh. great, I know her husband pretty well, you know. So the great thing about Dipali is that she started running the business and her husband has started managing the kitchen now. Yeah. I have, hello. Can I, yeah. I have a question? Manish. Manish. You know, I, I, I've, I've got to be careful in what I say. But cultural explanations are at best the soft bigotry of low expectations and at worst they are racism. A lot of what, a lot of what we see reflects the absence of the infrastructure of opportunity. If you treat this like a cultural problem, you won't be able to solve it in our lifetime. If you treat it like a plumbing problem, let's get all 63 million enterprises formalized. Let's get our cities urbanized. Let's get our schools fixed. Let's get the colleges fixed. And let's get 11% of our labor force in manufacturing up to 25% of our labor force in manufacturing. I mean, I think we ha if we want to do specific, finite, and actionable next steps, we can transform this in the next 10, 15, 20 years. If we're going to treat this like a cultural problem, the best solvent for cultural explanations is the infrastructure of opportunity. Yeah. You know, but one of the, one of the big lessons of the, the first panel discussion was that, uh, you know, I think it was very important that men have a very critical role to play. If you want women first, prosperity for all, men have a very, very critical role. And they need to get into roles which women have traditionally been performing. I mean, it's, it's very, very critical that women get into economic activities. They get, they start creating, giving a better, bigger and a higher contribution to, to GDP, and men get into role which traditionally and dominantly have been played by women. L Madam, you yes, go. hello everybody. Anne Ravanona, founder of Global Invest Her, a platform to help women entrepreneurs learn about funding. My question is. How do we get more women to become investors? And how do we get more men to invest in women? Great, great question. Great question, yeah. great question Madam Christina. Yes, it's a, it's a problem. Um, in fact, in the United States, about 72% of the venture capital funds are dominated by men and don't have any women who are making investment decisions. And actually, in Europe, it's even worse. So what do we do? Um, I think it's important to have major um, entrepreneurs who have become successful, women who have become successful, to lend their voice. So the Sheryl Sandbergs of the world, she needs to, to speak up as she has done and written the book. And then other women need to do the same. So you know, we have our women's networks that we've, we're establishing and we're putting together and trying hard to pull each other up. Uh, but that's not enough. I think we have to show that uh, it's actually important to have a diverse group in an investment committee or on a fund to be able to increase the returns. And there's data to prove that, that once it's a diverse group of 
investors uh, making that decision, the risks are lowered and the returns are being okay. increased. So Great. that's data so, so this is a very fascinating discussion on, so we're gonna break the time barrier a little bit. Uh, lady there, somewhere here, yeah, hi, please. Hi. Hi, I have just a question for Amitabh. Uh, so one of I'm, the I'm, not, I'm not a part of the panel, I'm a moderator. You but can shoot the question to the panel. I still, I, I, I still want yeah. you to think about this because uh, one of the things that, uh, this is a slightly unpopular question, one of the things that we uh, run into in the West is that there is, a, there is a negative impact of overconsumption and of too much wealth. And we all know that now, with the huge growth in suburbia and so on, we, you know, people are depressed. And in India, we have poverty is our advantage actually because it does somehow you know, create a better community where people are talking more, playing more, you know, we are just, there's no play dates, we play on the ground. And I'm wondering if, there's, if you, sir, have thought about you know, thinking even about consumption, rethinking consumption, so that we understand that we're not following the same roles as we, you know, we've been, at, like, at least my generation followed, which okay. is MBA okay. and you know, go to the West and so on. Um, you know, so my only response to that is that uh, when the, you know, American part of the world or the Western part of the world urbanized, land, gas, and water were all cheaply available. And because they were cheaply available, they created sprawling cities. Uh, you, you created cities like Atlanta where 99% of the people travel by car. I mean, that model of urbanization is dead. You need compact, dense cities. You need, you know, the process of urbanization has ended in America, it's ended in Europe, it's nearing its completion in China, in India, it's just begun. We will do more urbanization in the next five decades th than what, we have, what in India we've done in the last 5,000 years. So we need a very, if, if we follow the American and the European model of urbanization, we need four planet Earth. We have only one planet Earth. And therefore, India, therefore India needs to do a very innovative and sustainable model of urbanization. We need to ensure that our cities are embedded with public transportation. We recycle our water, we recycle our waste. That is the biggest challenge we have as we begin our process of urbanization, a very, very sustainable process of urbanization. Lady there, you were asking question. Please shoot. All the ladies here, you can shoot as many questions as you want, quickly. So can I ask a question? And no questions for any male here. <laughs> okay. I'm Sucharita from Catalyst for Women Entrepreneurship. And um, I wanted to say that in spite of all the cultural uh, challenges that was mentioned earlier, wi the women... Question, Madam, question. Come to the question. The women startup scenario is the fastest growing in the startup segment. So I wanted to ask if each of the uh, stakeholders, the investors, the government, uh, policy makers and the corporate sector, what would you like to do to make this fastest growing segment really, really move fast? So, Mark, uh, Christina, and then Lerato. Better access to credit, closing the digital divide that hold women, especially in the rural areas, back, creating mentorships to help women entrepreneurs take it to the next level. I think there are a number of things we can do, but the final thing is focus on men. Great. The problem uh, that women often face is discrimination, at least soft discrimination, by men. So work on messaging to men why it is that women are important in the workplace. Take those, uh, those success stories and message them to men. Christina, you want to add something? Yes. I, I think we need to have multilaterals get together and support and fund an emerging market fund supporting women. Okay, okay, wonderful. Next question. All right. Next question so last, last two I, questions. Sir, I'm lady, here, I'm the lady, here. The lady right here. Right here in front of you. Yeah. I'm of, here. My name is Aditi and I'm a woman entrepreneur. Um, one of my questions is, which is faced no, by... No, just one question. Yes. Just one question. My question is something that a lot of women entrepreneurs struggle with, and that is that, you know, men are in reality in more positions of, positions of power than women are. And when we need to seek their advice, mentorship, investment, whatever it might be, uh, you know, how, how do you make it so it's comfortable to the men themselves? Because many times men themselves are, you know, they, you know, they have wives and many times the wives do not like it that you are mentoring someone in the evening or after work and all and that's something okay. that is faced. Okay, so how do men provide mentorship? Manish. To women, yeah. Really? yeah. Without, <laughs> <laughs> without it being uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, you know. He's he's best equipped to respond to this. Come on. <laughs> on what basis? He runs he runs the vocational university in Gujarat. Come on, Manish. 
respond to that one. You know, first time I've seen okay, Manish faltering for words. It. I'll respond to it because yeah, yeah. I, I have male mentors and they're fabulous and many of them have daughters and that's the point. You know, it, it, there's data that proves that men become much more empathetic when they have daughters and when they have teenage daughters, the, they're even more empathetic. They've done surveys on this. Harvard's done surveys about this. So any woman at the back, anywhere? All right, here. Yeah, the lady, the lady there from. Yeah, yeah, please. No, let me give. You know, I'm, I'm breaking the time barrier because there's <laughs> terrific energy here. Yeah, man, please. No, no, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> You know, this is actually turning out to be the best session of this entire conference. <laughs> check, check. Yeah, please shoot. Uh, thank you. I thought you wouldn't see the woman in red yeah, out yeah. here. Please shoot. Anyways, uh, thank you for having us here. And before I shoot, I really have to talk to Madame Matsanai. I really like the way you spoke about spirituality. I think that is what is most important and needed in the world today. And I represent I represent the women of the Himalayas, you know. We are people who really need help and support. <coughs> and when you're all talking about aggregation, that, you know, is really, you know, talking to us. We have very small land holdings, and networking is very important. We would like to ask, we would like to ask the world's entrepreneurs, if you have space for us in your hearts, yeah. you know, please do something for us, okay? That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we are all here. So last, last, please. please. So this is, this is the last question of the day. And I turn to the, I turn to the lady on the left. Lady on the left. Yeah. My, my question is, how do you change the DNA of entitlement mentality in men? Oh, that's a, that's a really, that's, that's a really tough one. Manish, how do you change the DNA? Because it is. DNA of entitlement. Okay. Evil I've, I've never seen Manish Sabarwal at such a loss of words. Mark. Well, first off, I, I would say, uh, I, I, I think what you heard is just right. I think men who have daughters, yeah. I think have their eyes open. Sometimes they feel like they're surrounded. Since I have teenage daughters, I know what that is like. But no, uh, I think sister-to-sister -sister mentorships are incredibly important. Women entrepreneurs who can talk with other women entrepreneurs, they can share challenges, they can share solutions. To me, that is a very important yeah. way. No, I think that's a very important point Mark has made. You know, I have two daughters, and it's a great experience. They've outperformed me in every area of life. <laughs> and they've, you know, I mean, when I went to college, it was an all-male bastion. When my daughter went to the same college, St. Stephen's in Delhi, 88% of the students there were all women on merit. And the college said that you have, the college principal said that you have to give 10% extra marks to boys to ensure that it remains a co-educational college. You know, so so that's how that's how women in India are outperforming men in every single competitive exam of India. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that we conclude the session. Thank sir, you very much. Sir, sir, Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Let's go. Thank you. Great day. <laughs>